Perfect. On three. Ready? One, two, three. At this time, I would like to call up our science supervisor, Mr. Michael Page, and the representatives from Maryland Ag. <laughs> Queen Anne's County Public School students were invited to participate in a once-in-a-lifetime educational experience to learn about Maryland's number one industry, agriculture. As our population continues to grow, ag agriculture is crucial for our survival. Therefore, a coalition of agricultural educators and professionals joined together to host an educational experience for our seventh grade students here across the district. The Agricultural Awareness Committee hosted our seventh annual Agricultural Awareness Day on April 9th and 10th. The days were filled with numerous agricultural topics and allowed the students to have many hands-on experiences at each station to introduce them to many careers opportunities within agriculture field. This educational experience was held at the Queen Anne's County 4-H Park located outside of Centerville during school hours. After the event, seventh grade students were asked to answer this question. How did your experience change the way that you view agriculture? The Agricultural Awareness Committee reviewed the essays and selected the most impactful responses as our winners. And Mr. Page is gonna go through those winners at this time. Thank you very much. So I just wanna welcome everybody. And um, I want to also welcome Lee Bridgman from the uh, Extension Office and um, Janelle McHenry. For, from our uh, Agricultural Awareness Committee. And I, um, we are gonna start off with the overall winner. So we had an overall winner for, our, for the essay contest. Um, the overall winner is from Centerville Middle School and it is LMA Athey. So congratulations, LMA. Congratulations, LMA. Do we want to take this? Oh, every, you want everybody? Okay. All right. Now we have the winners from Centerville Middle School. Uh, first place was Sarah Clackren. Congratulations, Sarah. We had a tie for second place. Diana Johnson. Is she here today? And Wyatt Stevens. And third place also had a tie with Lucas Henderson and J.P. Tyler. And I failed to mention the prizes. So first place got Apple AirPods and ice cream cones and snow cones every day at the fair. And second place got a $50 gift card, ice cream, or snow cone every day of the fair. And third place got $25, three free ice cream cones or snow cones uh, at the fair. So those are the awards. All right, now we got Mattapeak Middle School. First place was Delaney Pugh. Second place was Vivian uh, Dorsey. And third place was Jessica Bush. Congratulations. And then Stevensville had one entry, uh, and that is Connor uh, Paterno. Good job, Connor. You got first place. Well, congratulations to you all, and thank you for your wonderful essays. Ready, one, two, three. Great. 
And I just want to give a shout out. Um, the, the partnership that we have and with Michael's leadership combined with that is amazing. And we can't thank you enough for providing very invaluable experiences for our students. Every year, it just gets better and better. When you think it can't get better, it gets better. And so I'm always so impressed. It's one of my favorite things to do each year. So thank you very, very much for your partnership. And thank you, Michael, for your leadership. I think we have a presentation right now um, so everybody can kind of see where the kids went and what they did during the actual um, days that they were there, Rag Day. Yeah, all right. Do we need to use the uh, microphone? Want to pass the mic along? We have, we're live again with them. Oh, oh so right. I can turn this off. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, something that may be a seal on or something. Where are the Well, we have to vote anyway, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. It's a PDF. Yeah. Yes, so the microphones, we're good to go? Yes. We All are right. Good to go. Well, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team, my name is Michael Page for the record. I am a curriculum supervisor with Queen Anne's County Public Schools, and I also have with me. I'm Lee Bridgman. I'm a program assistant with the University of Maryland Extension, and I work with the horticulture and the agriculture programs. Good afternoon. My name is Janelle Eck McHenry, local to Queen Anne's County. Um, grew up here on a farm, and today I'm working for an agriculture consulting firm, and I'm happy to sponsor and coordinate the event. And I also would like to give regards from Jenny Rhodes from the Extension Office and Jessica Clark, who are uh, a instrumental component to the planning process. Unfortunately, they were unable to make it today, but um, you know they they do send their regards. All right, so um, we're going to start off with the purpose. We just like to give you all an update of this wonderful day. Um, this is uh, um, a day in which we bring out all seventh grade students to the 4-H park, um, and we kind of have orchestrated the day in a way that really exposes them to all of the aspects of agriculture within our community and, and throughout Maryland. Um, and we'll go over all the various things that they um, learn. A little bit of background. Um, this is a program that utilizes uh, the Maryland Science Standards, Environmental Literacy Standards, um, and really is focused around agriculture. We have stations throughout the day in which we bring the students into the 4-H park and we cycle them through the various stations, uh, and it's a lot of hands-on learning. And this year we had something really cool um, where we embedded a lot of career. We had a total career fair. Thank you, sir. Um, and these, this is just an example of our stations. So we want to show off uh, some of the things that we, we did. And uh, Ms. McHenry is going to kind of discuss that for us. So we only have the students for a short period of time. So we decided to do five stations, about 50 minutes each, and covered the broad spectrum of the industry as there's so much to offer. So first we do aquaculture. We do a lot of stuff with oysters. We get some experts in on that industry to come teach our students. Then um, I work with the grain station where we talk about the decisions that a farmer makes as we have many hats as a farmer throughout the day. We also, for the first time, did a career station this year where we had a lot of our sponsors have a table and talk about what careers they have within because even if it's in ag, you might not be a farmer um, just so they could understand the variety that's available. Um, we also have a farm animal station where they learn about genetics and then they get to interact with these animals and learn one-on-one -on -one what they consume and um, with 4-Hers who are having these as youth projects. And then lastly, they also go through food safety and pollination as their final station throughout the day. Um, so very thankful for the sponsors we have in addition to those who have helped make our stations more interactive as we are not teachers and we understand the curriculum, but working with those that are experts to provide this material to the kids effectively. And I did just want to give a shout out 
for the career station and the, and the grain station to our uh, career coaches, uh, Betsy Ricketts and Karen Hansen and um, Connie Dean. They were all here. Uh, you were also honor. here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank them yeah. for their work this year and helping us. So as Janelle said, it, it takes a lot um, of volunteers and help to put this together. And this is a picture of uh, a lot of our volunteers, but I know a lot of us didn't make it either because we had some pretty tight schedules. So, uh, and, a, and a cow and horse. Right. So um, <laughs> that's the important Star. part, right? Yeah. Uh, so on your, I gave you a handout that's got a list of all of our sponsors, and it also includes those who collaborated. Uh, farms who might have brought animals. We have a lot of 4-H kids that bring their animals and love to talk about them. So, um, and every year, I think we had over 100 volunteers this year. So it wow. gets, gets bigger and bigger, and uh, which is good. All volunteers. So all of these individuals take two days out of their lives to come and, and showcase agriculture. So that, that's a huge um, applause to them for all the hard work that they do. And this is just showing some of our sponsors on the banner that we have this year. Um, again, they're on your list, but we couldn't do it without them because uh, we do have expenses associated with getting the kids out there for the day. And, um, and we appreciate, of course, the school board's help on that as well, um, and as well as giving us the day to do it. So. So this was our, this is the essay contest that we just discussed. So we want to just show you what that looked like in terms of we pushed this out to the schools and, uh, and they do a wonderful job of getting our students to really showcase what they learned that day. We also use this information for our grant writing. So when we're looking for funders, um, we, we kind of utilize this information for showing them what really the impact of our day is. Um, and so it's a great example of that. And, oh, I need to oh. give credit to the FFA this year, too. Oh, yes. We forced them to teach some of the pollination, <laughs> and they did it, and they did great, but they yeah. are a huge help for the day. So I wanted to make a special mention. Very of good, very good. So. Yes, and Mr. Stokes and his, yeah. his class <laughs> and organization. All right, and so this is, again, these are some of the, the um, questions that we ask in regards to uh, what, what kind of impact are we having on the students. Um, and again, this is also utilized for us to understand how well we're doing and also uh, utilized, again, for communicating to others like that we are creating an impactful day for the students. So 42% um, of students feel that they have more than average or great deal of knowledge in regards to agriculture. That's our whole premise of the day is to start to get students to really realize um, what is agriculture, how does it affect their lives, and so on. And then again, another success. Um, this question is really regarded as does agriculture affect your life every day? Um, and, you know, we drive past the fields um, with the combines in there, the people working, and uh, we see them every day driving to work through our community. Um, and really, you know, it does affect our lives every day. And those people out there working um, are, are a huge part of who we are as Queen Anne's and, and the food that we eat here. So in conclusion, uh, there is a little vi there is a video link that uh, we, we invite you to uh, view. Um, this is about the day it is uh, from, I believe it's from 2022, yeah. but um, it's a great way to sh show uh, exactly what the day looks like. Um, I want to thank everybody involved in terms of the uh, Agricultural Awareness Committee um, and, and all their hard work. Um, we're really excited for this day every year. We're excited, we're already starting to plan it out, um, you know, going forward. So we wanna thank all of you for your support. Thank you all for your time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just an overall great day. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you all have any questions. You know, I actually do have one question. If somebody wanted on their farm, wanted to go from traditional farming to organic, how many years does it take to transition? Is there a set number of? Years. Um, for land, it's going to take a full three years to transition from a commercial operation to organic. Animals take about one year for that transition to occur. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, for those of you... Um, that are watching we had some we had some sound issues but now we have the sound back which is why we kind of went out of our order and so we did have 
uh, ratification of, uh, of some of our contracts. And so I want to thank everybody, the negotiating team, um, uh, the board, everybody to uh, that put all this time and effort in to make this a three-year contract for everybody. So that's a great thing. And so now can I get a motion to ratify the certif certificated unit one contract? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Can I get a motion to ratify the support units one, two, and three contracts? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Okay. I believe we're back on track and we can start with board involvement. Mr. Tolley's next. Oh, is he? Yes. Career Center. Oh, yes, I'm so, oh, Mr. Tolley, I'm so sorry, y'all. And I'm looking at Connie and I'm looking at y'all and <laughs> glossed over. My apologies. Can I use this point if I turn that down? So, or do you want me here? Oh, you're not asking me. I'm assuming. Yeah, you can um, turn that yeah. Off. okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Adam Tolley. I'm supervisor of career and technical education, and we are here tonight. I'm here with my wonderful team, and we are here tonight to officially, formally recognize um, the grant uh, that established our career centers and uh, gave us the ability to hire our career coaches. And in a second, I'm going to turn it over to to Miss Connie Dean, who is the uh, coordinator of uh, workforce development that we work closely with. I have my Two wonderful career coaches, Karen Hessen and Betsy Ricketts, with me here tonight. Uh, Connie will give you some more information on this grant, but, but we are very fortunate to be able to get the grant. We want to recognize our partnership with Queen Anne's, uh, Queen Anne's County Department of Economic and Tourism Development. Uh, we have Ms. Heather Tonelli here tonight, who is the director of that department. Uh, so without their support, the support of the Upper Shore Regional Council, where the grant originated from, Queen's County Commissioners, Dr. Salem's the Board of Ed, none of this would happen. So we're going to do sort of a, a quick recognition uh, by numbers that the coaches will go through, but Connie's going to give a, a bit of an overview of the grant, so I will I will turn it over to her. Good evening. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity to share with you the progress of our career and workforce development initiative over this past school year. Um, often called the Career Centers Grant for short. Um, this two-year grant is a direct outcome of the strong partnership between Queen Anne's County Public School System and Queen Anne's County Economic Development. Um, I have to stop and thank Dr. Salings and Adam Tolley for helping make that partnership happen with us. Um, back in 2022, Adam Tolley and I collaborated to secure a grant to provide resources and dedicated staff for a career center at each high school. This would involve, among other things, strengthening and expanding connections with our local businesses and providing career awareness and career exploration opportunities for all students. We want to take a moment to thank Upper Shore Regional Council for their support. Under the direction of Susan O'Neill, their generous grant allowed us to implement this endeavor. Through the grant, we've been able to hire um, a dedicated career coach and establish a career center at each of the two high schools. And the two career coaches are next to me. Karen's at Ken Island High School and Betsy at Queen Anne's County High School. These two positions have been key in establishing daily career development focused interactions with students and providing a direct contact at the schools for businesses who want to be involved with any of the career development programs in place. In just the first school year, with our career coaches and career centers in place, services um, from this initiative have reached 1,835 high school students and 1,615 middle school students. The initial focus for this first year was on high schools, but as you can see, um, have already extended initial career coach services to our middle schools also. Um, the other piece is that you'll see that um, 100 at the bottom of the screen, 129 local businesses have had direct involvement with numerous career programs and events that we have in place this year already. Um, I'm going to let Betsy and Karen now share with you in a very brief overview <laughs> of the many things going on, some of the accomplishments that have happened during this 2023 to 24 school year. 
So the first thing we wanted to touch on was um, the partnership with USRC, so Upper Shore Regional Council. Um, through their equipment scholarship, we were able to sponsor 39 students through nine pathways. Um, so we were able to purchase them boots, uh, gloves, welding helmets, muck boots. Eye protection. Um, eye protection, yeah, things like that. Uh, another update since we were here last is we've been designated as uh, both high schools are purple star schools and Betsy and I are acting as the military family. So we are actively working this summer to stand up purple star clubs and we already have student, uh, what do we call it? the inaugural student groups standing up the clubs at both high schools. So we're very excited about that. So between Queen Anne's County High School and Kent Island High School this year, we had 220, or I'm sorry, 299 students that um, participated in the work-based learning program at the high schools. Um, so these students left um, and they went and got hands-on experience out in our workforce. And we have three students that graduated at, with apprenticeships, all three completing well over four, the 450 hour requirement. And they're all three placing into culinary after, well, they've graduated high school this year. So they're all three placing in culinary positions or school. <laughs> this one? Oh, yeah, okay. okay. There we go. <clears throat> All right. Um, so we had 12 field trips this year to local businesses um, that included trips to Gillespie in Chestertown or PRS Guitar in Stevensville. And even a couple of one-on-one -on -one or very small group, two to three students going out to see the airport, um, a yacht sales broker, and other places that wouldn't necessarily be able to um, hold a large group like Marty Brown Racing right off Ruthsburg Road uh, took a one-on-one -on -one student tour. Yeah, so the Twice. field trips, yeah. <laughs> so the field trips um, they range between one student going to up to 60 students going. Uh, um, we put on eight career fairs across middle schools and high schools inside the school system and outside with partnering with Rotary Club, um, Regional Expo, and various other <laughs> groups. It was, it was a whirlwind. Um, so at some of those mm -hmm. career fairs, in addition to one-on-one, -on -one, uh, we were able to reach 309 students um, through mock interviews. Some of the fun field trips that we did, uh, we partnered with Junior Achievement this year, even more than last year, and um, they invited us to the Leadership Academy. So this was our first year going. We were able to invite high school students to go, and again, they got headshots. They really felt heard. Uh, the governor, uh, or not governor, the mayor, mayor. of Ta mm -hmm. uh, Easton was there, and she interacted with every student that was in present. Um, they got to meet local businesses, even some from Queen Anne's County because of Connie. So uh, that was fantastic. Um, this year between the two high schools, we had 396 sophomores. Um, they went on a career awareness tour at Chesapeake College. Um, they were able to tour the trades programs. They were able to do, um, they had a nursing tour as well, or a health tour, health professionals tour. Um, and again, through with Connie and uh, Adam and just be college, uh, they made that possible. So that was really amazing. Oh, that one, first one's your baby, go ahead. So we had, um, <laughs> this year we had six testing days at both high schools. Um, and through those six yeah. testing days, we had 194 students earn their learner's permit um, with a 100% success rate. And then again with Junior Achievement, we took the middle schoolers out to Junior Inspire. So that's eighth grade participating in the most hands-on career day I have ever seen. Um, They're actually cutting a large gauge wire in that picture. Um, it was much more difficult than I ever thought it would be. And uh, behind them is a horse. Yes, so, there yeah, is there's... a horse straight <laughs> right off the corner and a boat from the Coast Guard, even some, and NASA was there with robots. It was, it was amazing. Um, and then also with JA, we were able to do Finance Park with seventh grade, which hearing seventh grade students realize that cell phones aren't free and kids cost money was priceless. <laughs> so. <clears throat> now Adam. Adam yeah. Thank you. And this is this is the, the last slide that we have. And um, again, I just want to I want to thank everyone, um, you know, for the participation and, and what they have done. As you can see, you know, we've had an amazing year um, and we're looking forward to to making next year even more amazing for our students and just some, you know, 
inaugural um, activities, the the MBA testing, and, and the list goes on and on. It's just been an amazing, amazing year, and it wouldn't happen without the, the partnerships, like I mentioned. You know, our wonderful partnership with with Heather and Connie's office, and uh, their office actually put this slide show together, which looks which looks amazing. Um, but just this slide is just kind of a highlight. You know, our CT teachers. Um, get a lot of credit for this. Our trades enrollment is maxed out uh, this year. Um, it's doubled, the, the interest has doubled in, in the past couple years. We had 50 students that enrolled, that signed up for welding this year, unheard of, and I haven't heard that number in, in any other district, to be honest with you, even even in the bigger districts. Um, you know, 48 students that, that signed up for carpentry. Just absolutely amazing numbers, and it, it's, it's not attributed to one factor. It takes a team to, to do those things, and so we're just, very proud, um, and as you all know, I could talk all night, but I'm going I'm to end it there. <laughs> Super proud of what the coaches have done, what, what Connie has done, and, and again, wouldn't happen without the support of everyone. So thank, thank, thank everyone. You, that's thank amazing, you. Adam, for your yeah. I do want to say I've heard a lot of comments about uh, the career coaches in a really positive way throughout the community. And of course, thanks to Heather and, and Connie and Adam for um, spearheading this, but really good stuff. Although I have a question about the full to capacity. So do we have a plan? <laughs> if We're working on it. <laughs> All right. Well, um, What's a lot of it's connected with making part our partnerships with Chesapeake College. We're okay. actually looking yes. at lots of opportunities if you want to speak to that, but the, like welding looking at taking a course of the welding as dual enrollment at Chesapeake College and then working with placements and okay. related jobs. So. Yes, yeah, Matt, uh, actually Matt Evans and I have <laughs> met with Chesapeake several times. We're working out the courses they're gonna do, a dedicated course for us, for high school students, which they have never done. Uh, Matt has <clears throat> helped secure transportation through um, Queen Anne's County. Uh, Local management, we're transportation. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're really trying to get those <laughs> opportunities for the kids. If we can't get them in our programs, we're trying to get them that experience. So Great. it's, a, it's, it's an exciting awesome. time. Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. Thank you. That thank as well as so adding, career, even career, adding career pathways there. So. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. If, I, if you don't mind, if I, I would like to say that having been in the school system and with for a long time, it's been really exciting to witness the dedication of the two career coaches. It's just been perfect. And the excitement, though, among the students um, staff, educators at the schools, and the businesses. Um, it's been just about the whole initiative in, in general. So it's been pretty exciting. Let's go ahead and move on. We are on board involvement now, correct? All right. Anybody want to start? Okay. I'm okay. not sure how it's June, but <laughs> <laughs> yes. just want to say congratulations to all the graduates and then to the rest of the students. Enjoy your summer. It sure went quick. <laughs> well, um, did quite a few things in uh, May. It was a busy month. Mm. But the one thing that stood out to me was our budget hearings. Yes. Um, I attended the one in Centerville viewed both Stevensville and Ken, uh, Stevensville and Southersville. And I was very, I thought it was very respectful. People spoke from passion, from their heart, and what we needed to do and how we were going to get there. But we got some problems. This county is very generous. It's given us $7 million over maintenance effort. That's a 10% increase. That's not sustainable. We're trying to meet our blueprint obligations. But if the state does not step up, it's not going to happen. And I appreciate everybody and the way they handled themselves, board members, Dr. Salins, and everybody that attended these meetings. The commissioners are not our issue. The state's our issue. And if we don't have people, the teacher association and citizens that were passionate at these budget hearings, talking to our state legislators and over in the state for this, we're going to be in the same boat, not being able to honor contracts, having the issues with not being able to fund positions. It's going to happen. And I don't mean to be doom about it. We can get through this, but it's not going to be next May and say, because this board has worked very hard on a budget and we knew this was coming. Nobody listens until it happens right. and it's going to happen again. So you better get to the state because I am very thankful that the commissioners, the taxpayers gave us $7 million in three years. That's $21 million. This is reoccurring. This is not a one time thing. This is their, they've committed this for in, in 10 years. I have to be a $70 million increase. We better wake up. 
Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, and by the way, the session starts in January. So if you want to go speak, starts in January. Um, on a more positive note, I want to reiterate also just the graduates. It was wonderful going to both graduations, and I hope everyone has a, a very safe and wonderful summer. Um, yeah, like everybody else, it's been a very busy May. Um, so along with the commissioners meetings that everybody talked to, graduations at both high schools, those students were just wonderful. Um, I also attended the Churchill Blue Ribbon flag raising. Oh, yes. That was awesome. That was fun. Um, lots of good food. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, that was um, an activity. Um, I also uh, was asked to participate in a Maryland Reads session um, with our county to start looking at other ways that outside of our school district, our community, can come in and help us um, with education of our students. And so I've committed to try to make as many of those meetings as I can and provide input. So that's where we are. OK, Dr. to say one. Yes, um, I also want to say congratulations to our graduates, to Picture Perfect Days at graduation, Ooh, yeah. for sure. I mean, it was wonderful. And just an overall thank you to all of our staff members. We've had a great year as we conclude our year. Thank you for everything that you do for our students to be successful. Everything you do indeed does make a difference. Um, I do want to take an opportunity, though, to address a couple of misconceptions, I feel, that are in the community. Um, so as, as everyone well knows, um, we've been through the budget process. Um, Mr. Smith just alluded to um, the different hearings that took place, and I, too, was very pleased uh, um, with everyone being very civil, respectful, and responsible, um, and, and passionate um, for what's very important to all of us, which is our staff, obviously. Um, we know that I asked for, you know, the commissioner said, what is, it, what is it that you need to make you whole for teacher? your reading specialist and math specialist, and that would be 24, $2.4 million, because we have 24. We average the cost of a teacher to be about $100,000. Um, we got $1.2 million. Um, obviously, that doesn't make us whole, so we had to go from a district perspective. And I think when we posted positions as district-wide positions, people thought that they would be housed here and that they're not going to be meeting the needs of kids. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, so the positions that we will now be interviewing for, we posted the positions we'll be interviewing for. Um, they'll be make, we will be, I will be making a recommendation to this board. Hopefully this board will approve that recommendation. Um, and then we would set schedules. I don't know exactly how many people are like, how many? Is it going to be eight? Is it going to be 10? I don't know. Every one of our staff members is paid differently because of their years of experience. So our more experienced people obviously make more money. So if we have a lot of people that fill the positions that are more experienced, we won't be able to have as many. If we have people that have less experience, we'll be able to have more. So it, I can't come up with a, a given number right now until we know who those people are so that I can determine how many people we're going to have. But I, I definitely wanted to make sure that everyone clearly understands that that money is going back into the teacher specialist positions. It's just going to look a little different. So a teacher specialist, instead of being at a building every single day, maybe that building doesn't have as high of a need. So maybe they have a teacher specialist there two days a week, and then that teacher specialist goes to another school three days a week. Um, so we just have to see how their schedules fall out based on the needs of the school district. We do have Title I schools. We do have a community school. Obviously, those are higher need schools. So those are all things that are going to work out. I want to say thank you for your patience. I know this is a trying time. I know it's challenging. I know it's disruptive, and, and it's um, sometimes even a, a heart hurter because, you know, you're one of those staff members, and you don't, what am I going to be doing next year? Um, hang tight. We, we promise we're going to have a plan of action. It's just going to take us time. It's a process. We can't just arbitrarily say we're going to pick these teacher specialists out of the ones that we have right now. That wouldn't be fair, and it wouldn't be equitable. So it is a process. I thank you for being patient and working through that process. We promise we're going to try to get everybody in a good seat on the school bus as we move forward into the next year. So that timeline will be probably we are we do have a meeting uh, later June, but we won't be ready to make recommendations because we have to go through this mm -hmm. big process. But the board does have a meeting on July 17th. I do anticipate that we hopefully will be coming to the board with recommendations for all of the teacher specialist positions at that point um, so that we can move forward with scheduling. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salins. Okay, next is our citizen participation. We ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. 
Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of the schools or the board president. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board rep respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but ask as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you show respect for all. First on the list, Mr. Richard McNeil. <laughs> Richard McNeil, uh, representing myself and the retired uh, group. And um, uh, Mr. Smith, I appreciate what you say because in our retirement group, we are pushing for legislative to support counties. And, uh, you know, the, it drives me crazy and probably you more when legislators mandate certain things, but they don't give you the funds to take care of that. So that'll be something else. But. Uh, on behalf of the retired uh, school personnel, we'd like to gra congratulate all the seniors who graduated. Um, I can remember as a principal that that is a big event and it, it goes off in it, and I appreciate that. Um, I may be off a little bit, but you know, if I did my calculations right, a student going through K through 12 would be roughly 14,040 hours. And I think I'm off a little bit, but you can straighten me out. <laughs> Check your math and get back to you. Okay, it's gonna work. And you know, even at a at a good medium salary, that would be close to four hundred and eighty thousand dollars over the course of that twelve years. And you know, it's very much, in my opinion, worthwhile because these are the folks who are going to be the leaders in the next generation. That's and there. you know, we got to make sure they're off to a good, strong foundation and I know that's what everybody's after on that part. Um, at our meeting on uh, luncheon on um, Tuesday, and I think we've got a couple of members coming, so we'll be happy to say hello to you. We're gonna be honoring two of our scholarship winners and I'd like to mention them tonight just so everybody out there can hear who they are. Uh, from, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing these right. So uh, from Queen Anne's High School, it's Carly Hershey. Uh, did a great job on her um, uh, essay, if you will. And from Ken Island High School, it's Kirsten Curry. And um, did another, another great job. So yeah, we can applaud them. We'll, we're nice. gonna recognize them and honor them at our luncheon on Tuesday and uh, so forth. One of the things that uh, came across my mind uh, as I was kind of thinking about graduation, you know, you you got a smooth pond you drop a pebble in and those ripples go forever and um, it's always a comforting feeling to me when I see former students that either I taught or were in high school when I went through there who come back and they've got a solid career and that's the best thing that I, we can hope for as an organization is to provide that information and background to get them off to a good start not everybody needs to go to college, but everybody needs to have a good career. And, and that's what I see on that aspect. So let's keep the pebbles going. Let's keep the ripples out there and so forth. Have a safe summer, safe close of school on Friday. And, I, and I'm talking about the teachers not going crazy on Monday. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Jen Green. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I was at the um, commissioner meeting at Ken Island and um, speaking about the essential positions of teachers. And I'm pleased to be here to, with you today. One thing that the county commissioners made clear is that while they um, were happy to hear from us, the ultimate people that we needed to speak with was the Board of Education. So here I am. <laughs> um, and. Certainly I wanna recognize that there are state issues that you have to contend with and we understand that. 
The reality is, however, we are now facing a budget situation that affects our students this year, and you have the responsibility to prioritize that budget, and I want to speak to those priorities. So while the county commissioners approved an additional $1.2 million for essential teachers, specialists, and classroom teachers in response to record-setting community engagement, the response from the Board of Education, as you mentioned, Ms. Salins, was to create a, um, a county approach. From my perspective, what I would have liked to see this board do, and I would still advocate that you do, is to go back to your budget and find a match. Find a $1.2 million match to make sure that these specialists stay in our schools. They're essential. Our students have gone through a COVID learning loss. There's a documented, there's a documented learning loss from Stanford University, from Harvard University, that shows our county suffered a one grade level loss in testing and math. And math and reading specialists are essential to bringing those students up to par and up to where they were before. Um, I just want to also mention that I did look through your 2023 to 2024 budget, and I saw increases across the board in non-essential, what I would, lovely areas, but when in difficult budgeting years, areas that I would not prioritize. Essential teachers, classroom teachers, and reading and math specialists are the last place. They're the last line you cut. So when I look at it, I see increases in administration, transportation, sports, health services. Look, no one wants to cut those things. But when you have to make difficult budget decisions, those would be the places that I would go to have a look, to say, do I need to bring these levels down to pre-2022 levels? How can I find a way to make sure that our students are not suffering? Because increased class sizes combined with the loss of reading and math specialists is a one-two punch to our kids. It's really gutting an essential service that our kids really need. And I'm asking you and pleading with you to please reconsider your budget. Please go back. I worked for a multinational corporation that had a billion dollars in, in revenues, and we had less than 10 finance positions. And I'm looking at your administration, I see 10 finance positions. Do we really need those? If we're gonna cut positions, where are we cutting? Not teachers. Look at your administration. We have an AI that makes administration vastly more efficient. Cut support staff. I hate to say that, but teachers are the last place to cut. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. All right, we send it for public comment. All right, moving on to the action items. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the HR report as presented? I moved. Can I get a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm sorry, I didn't hear all the way through, so sorry. I was like. My voice just kind of went. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so at this point, um, I thank you for approving our HR report for this month. And in there, we have three appointments for three new principals for next school year coming up. So I'd like to recognize them at this time and have them come forward. Um, the first one for Ken Island Elementary School is Mrs. Kathy Barletto. <laughs> Yep. Second one is our new principal of Stevensville Middle School, Mrs. Amy Smith. Well, at Madison. 
Pacific Elementary School, this is Kayleen Koga. Next up is Mr. Combs. Good evening, Good President Bennett, Superintendent Salins, board members, executive team. Uh, for the record, my name is Josh Combs. I am the supervisor of technology. Uh, today, I um, have just a couple of purchase approvals. Uh, first one being um, our renewal for Microsoft licensing. Um, okay. See here. Um, this is done through the meat contract, which is something that all the counties um, are part of and all the several governments. I also included pricing from multiple other contracts throughout the country. So where you can compare the difference between what we're paying for versus what you might get on other contracts. Um, this contract here basically only increased a thousand about two thousand dollars from last year, it's like a one point six percent increase so pretty pretty marginal in terms of what we paid last year which was great I did have a question about the other two the so you're saying that for like the Microsoft 365 subscription yep. meek is 40 almost 48 dollars and the other ones are 11 dollars uh, I'm sorry that was that was total it was actually oh that's for all the counties I must have put the wrong one in there. It was actually for just one of the items. That was my mistake. That 47 is basically total where that one PEM is only one portion of it. I'll update this and I can I can re-upload it, but the, you know, we didn't have, the meat became the, the cheapest contract of all the other contracts, but I'll make sure I update this correctly. Um, Because it should be seven sixty four, not forty seven sixty four. Uh, well, the contract says fifty five thousand five hundred ninety five at the forty seven sixty four. When you look at the quote, yeah, the, that probably when you look at the option A three United, it's basically multiple products put into one. Um, it's not just one thing. Um, that's why you, you have to break it down. Like Defender, uh, Visio is one thing, but this is off. I can't remember. I don't have my stuff with me right now, but. Do we have a timeline as to yeah, when we so need to yeah. have this done? No, no, we, I can get this I was say, tonight can we, and then you guys can see it. Can we put it on the 26th? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't need to do this until uh, July, July 1st. Okay. And Stan, she will capture that. And that way you can see the pricing okay. between all, all so three. We'll, right. Thank you. We'll Thank push you. Push no, absolutely. Okay. We'll Another push. question. I say in budget sources, you've got scratched out 24, to use 25. Is there any scale like multi-year contract with that same as any or is this a year uh, not for Microsoft okay well it is a multi-year agreement that meek goes with Microsoft so we usually do a five-year deal um, they haven't done a five-year deal they basically we're doing an extension of the previous contract until they settle on a multi-year deal 
that kind of locks our pricing in for the next um, next five years. Like you can only it only goes up three percent or something like that. They Is that what that they called in. their up? What do they call that? The up lift or whatever? It was some kind of odd name. It said it's tied in except for an, a normal uplift in price. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. We'll, Thank you. We'll go ahead and yeah. push this till, okay. until next time. All right. I think you have the next one too. Yes. Uh, this is another renewal. This one is a little more correct. So this is a renewal of our content filter. That's our student staff internet content filter that uh, we have to have by law. You also see again the same prices. Um, so Meek is six ten. Uh, the next company closest is Insight at eight dollars ninety nine cents. <coughs> Any questions? Okay. All the yep. Go ahead. <laughs> Recommend that the Board of Ed approve the purchase of the Lightspeed Content Filter subscription through the reseller Data Networks for a term of July 1, 2024 through June 30, 2025. Fiscal impact $56,730. Budget source FY25. Technology software licensing budget. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Ms. Passon. And can I say green is a lovely color on you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good evening, President Bennett and members of the board, Dr. Salem, and members of the executive team. For the record, my name is Bridget Passon. I'm the English Language Arts Supervisor for grades 3 through 12. I am here for my annual request for materials to support Tier 1 instruction for our high school and middle school classes, so English classes. So I'll start with item 6.04, which is for our high school digital licenses and consumables. These are the materials necessary to support English 1 through 4. Any questions? Any questions? Um, let's see. Uh, recommend that the Board of Ed approve the purchase of the digital license and consumables. Thanks. From my perspectives, from Savas, mm -hmm. fiscal impact $82,495.33. Budget source FY25, unrestricted operating funds. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Move on to the next item, 6.05. Same request, but for our middle school ELA courses uh, to support all those classes ELA 6 through ELA 8. Any questions? Shout out. Trying to get through this. Um, suggest that the Board of Ed approve purchase of digital license and some more textbooks for the collection from Halton Melvin Harcourt. Fiscal impact $119,471.92. Budget source FY25 unrestricted operating funds. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. We have Ms. Smith. And congratulations again. Thank you. She's still doing this for a couple weeks. <laughs> I was say, I didn't get to leave with everyone else. <laughs> so good evening, Ms. Bennett, Dr. Salins, board members, and executive team. I am here with the iReady Classroom Mathematics textbooks I brought to you last month for public review. We haven't had any comments so far. Um, this is to kind of get the pre-approval for it when the amendment comes in, if the amendment is approved. Otherwise, I'll be back in July requesting for the budget money to be used towards the online platform. Okay. Questions? The one thing, I guess a question, a couple of years ago, we went from a lot of uh, capital money to, for books and, and things. I know things are changing, consumable stuff, electronic. We, we lost that. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that when we look at our budget next year, I know we have a capital and, and we have a you know, certain number they like to see every year, but is there something we can start pushing some of that into capital? If, if, if it's long enough you know, to meet those needs? We, we did push technology back into that category this year. So I do foresee some things that have a, not software, mm -hmm. we can't no, do I software, but, but textbooks that, that are, you know, we use for 20 
sometimes more years. And so that would be something that we wouldn't consider. To, right, yeah, exactly. And, and don't we have one of the licenses for five years for some of the stuff? Is, would that not qualify? That wouldn't right? qualify. Okay. That's not okay. long enough, no. Is there a magic number? N no, that's, you just look at kind of the life of the, of the product itself. Okay. It's the life of the product. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it's three or four years or five years, that's not going to cut it. But when you're looking at 20 or 30 yeah. years, like furniture, furniture is yeah. another great example that, you know, we, we had the original furniture at Queen Anne County High School that we just replaced. So obviously that's been Capital. there for 40, yeah, 40 yeah. years. All right. So anything else? Okay. I recommend that the Board of Education approve the contract pending approval from MSDE with iReady fiscal impact $69,683.20. Budget source, local 46,900, leads $22,783.20. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great evening. You too. You. Okay. Mr. Grove. Well, we have got quite the... Mm -hmm different people. Yes, that's wonderful. Good evening, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, executive team, members of the board. Uh, tonight, bringing to you, uh, for the record, sorry, my name is Jonathan Groh. I'm the supervisor of accountability. And tonight I'm bringing to you a renewal contract for uh, Power Schools Performance Matters um, assessment, assessment analytics choice. Um, this tool um, continues to be very valuable for us. Um, it houses a lot of our data um, from our uh, test scores our, that are local or uh, from state. It matches very well with MSDE when we go back and forth. Um, we also use it for our testing platform, for our uh, final exams, for our local assessments, um, cr um, content uh, assessments. Um, very, very valuable um, to our to our district. Um, so we're looking to uh, renew this. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. Nope. Recommend that the board approve a contract with Power School for the use of Performance Matters Assessment Analytics Choice. Fiscal impact sixty nine thousand thirty five dollars seventy three cents. Budget source unrestricted. Operating budget. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gast. Good evening, President Bennett, Vice President Bent, Dr. Saling, Dr. Kibler, members of the board and executive team. Um, this evening I present to you a, a request the approval for the purchase of TimeCloud Plus. That's our timekeeping system and it integrates with our financial management system, eFinance. It's also by Power School as well. This is our second year with it, correct? Yep. Yes, this is our first full year. And we were looking for all these benefits. Have we realized all those great? You know, I, I will not lie. It has been a struggle to get this really in place and working. Um, we, I don't feel like we've gotten everything that we um, really wanted to get out of it yet, but we certainly have made a lot of progress. Um, it, it is, there has many capabilities to be able to track attendance in various different lanes and be able to produce reports so we can see how many people took sick leave, how many people took bereavement, and uh, you know, as you divide out the different categories. Um, but we still have a little ways to go. Yes, uh, we do have a new system administrator, so I'm, I'm sorry. We have a new system administrator okay. for finance, so I'm hopeful that we can yes. utilize and, and more of the Yes, and has made leaps and bounds well. since the second yes. it came I'm, into the door. I'm very hopeful that we will make Has resolved many, many of the concerns Perfect. we had. So yes. you're absolutely right. I anticipate us being able to really get everything up and running that we wanted to have for next school year. Yeah, okay. he's been amazing. I, and then, yep. oh, sorry. I did, I was say, we used ADP before, which is obviously a very well known timekeeping system, but it was costing us over 150,000 per year. That was the last year we had it. And this one is only 62, 63,000. So this is yeah. definitely a cost savings as well. And that one we couldn't do anything with. Right. Mm -hmm. It so, does not integrate to yeah, finance so like the cost this does. And, right. Is there a time frame for this one that you'll know whether like the cost savings of not even just how much it costs, but what you guys are wanting to do with it? Um, I was going to say, I know like I have plans for it. I don't, I don't know if that could be monetary. I think, but like we also, I mean, 
I'm thinking for federal grants, you're required to have a time commute system that integrates to your financial management system. This one does more seamlessly than others because it is built by power school as well. So I think that is one of the key benefits of this is that power, this is the company power school recommends. They, this is what they prefer us to use in order to have the best integration. Do we know what was the cost? How, many, how much is it going up each year? Because sixty-two thousand is still. What was I? I do, we don't. That's okay. I don't know. I, mean, I thought we were paying over a hundred thousand for ADP. Well, right, for ADP was well, over. She said that, but I mean for yeah. this one from time. It's, or like, mm, is it every it year? Or we, and I wish. I'm sorry. Power school that. products roughly seem to be around that three to five percent okay. annual increase. Okay. Oh, thank you. And this is always an annual contract. They don't ever do like ex different. We're, we're working on it. We're working on that. Okay. Trying to do a bundle. We actually have several power school right. components. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, at this point, power school really is just gobbled up everything. Yes. All the different right. so performance matters that John just was speaking of. That's that used fine. to be its own platform. And then they got bought out. And so power school has been buying out all these other things that we use and integrating them together, which is wonderful because it does make it seamless. However, we have all these contracts right. and now we're trying to bundle them together so that we can save we're on some costs very early talks of that so it may not happen in 25 but hopeful for 26. Wait, sorry we're in very early stages of discussing bundling with that and multi-year contracts with them but we have brought that up so we're hopeful that potentially going forward we can do yeah hopefully next those. year this time we will right. well, that'd be a problem though if they're that's going to be the only platform available to, to public schools uh, the whole state is, it seems like there are everything. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say there are some benefits. I mean, so with them going to the bundle, like, mm -hmm. so our uh, evaluation tool that we use. So the platform we were on two years ago was basically out of date and PowerSchool didn't want to service it anymore. So they actually allowed us to upgrade to their most current version and actually integrated it with this contract kind of split and actually gave us the latest and greatest for the same price we were paying at it. So we got a discount there. So they are, they are working with us. It's not always quick with the big company, all the different products we have, but um, we are but work, it, working it on it. It does save us time and energy on a lot of the state reporting because they actually develop right. the end product for us. So we just can go in and kind of run a report <laughs> basically. And that report is what the state is looking for in certain format and they've already set it all up for us. So a person on our end doesn't have to go through that whole process of setting up the report and all the different categories in that report and everything because power school is doing it conglomerately for all of the districts because they don't serve every district, but they do serve the majority of the districts in Maryland. And MSD is almost like almost cornering most of the districts to use yes. it for the financial reporting yeah. aspect. Yeah. So. And then PowerSchool is um, services all of these, so they're directly through PowerSchool. Is there any like third party? So TimeCut Plus is actually the third party, but this oh. is their only module. Okay. So it's a separate company, but they, it's their company that they chose as their timekeeping intended. Okay. That's a great question. Any other question? question? Uh -huh. I'm a firm believer student needs to be in school because yes. if they're not there so many days, they're true. Also, we need teachers in front of those yes. and staff. No, I've asked this question, not this year, but more in one year. <laughs> I'm going to ask it again, probably. No, that's good. <laughs> we need to track stuff. I know our staff has the same issues as society does. Some days you're sick, some right. days you got a doctor's appointment and all this. But I see a lot of substitutes. And I just think, you know, the, the most biggest resource we have is teachers in front of our students. And I just really am concerned sometimes on certain days that, you know, we might have a high absenteeism or some. And, I, I, I asked this question, and, and last year I was told, oh, well, this is going to solve our, you know, we'll be able to mm -hmm. track some stuff. I'm, I'm hearing right now, <laughs> we got a lot of holes in it. We're not tracking it. You know, I'm, I'm too old. I'm, I'm, I won't be here. <laughs> right. I think, um, so right now we do track a lot of our, the use of our um, accumulated leave days in a separate, in an HR portion of this. The goal is to get it into Time Clock Plus because it does do that. And then it'll be any finance and we can run better reports with it. So Wait a minute, am I understanding you, you haven't put any of the... Oh no, they, they, they do integrate already, but there's certain checkpoints where they're not tied as well as they should be. They're not integrated as much as I mean, I just think I for think a manager, for, <laughs> for, for a supervisor or, or a principal, principal probably has a better hand up, but some of these schools, the high schools, mm -hmm. 1200, some of the middle schools are 600. 
you know, they, you know, if you have too many people out, it must be tough. Right. And I'm going to defer because I do, I don't know the substitute system that well. I do know there is a way that. Well, I, one thing I'm glad it might, it, this is not accurate because I'm getting this from my grandchildren. <laughs> a lot of times, well, my teacher wasn't there when, <laughs> today, yesterday. I mean, and I'm sure there's good reasons for it. I'm not, you know, they, 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 they got their life too. But I just think we need people and it just, it concerns me sometimes. Uh, I mean, staff attendance has been a problem since post-COVID. Um, I mean, aggressively so. Um, obviously, <laughs> att attendance prior to COVID, people take off time. They get a lot of time. I mean, mm -hmm. here they get four personal leave days. They don't get four personal leave days. I don't know of any other district, at least on the shore, that has four. So they, they get the time. They get their sick leave, and they use their time. Um, I think they use it more now post-COVID than they did prior right. to COVID. Um, I will have to say that the attendance for our students has come up this year. We were pretty much on the mark at 92% across the board. The state um, expects you to be at 94%. You want to reach for 96%. So we were much better than last year. So I see that attendance getting better, and I'm hopeful that we'll continue that we'll see that trend maybe with our staff as well. We do have indicators on um, as part of their contract now where. You know, we put caps when it, it comes to um, using personal leaves. So they can only have so many a percentage, 5% out, you know, approved for personal leave. Um, if they try to go above that, they're denied. So we're, we're doing our very best to try to put caps so that we don't have a given day where it's a beautiful Monday and nobody wants to come in or that type of thing where we try to curb that as much as possible. But I, I agree with you. I think attendance across the state um, for superintendents has been uh, talking points for us for months and months now because I mean if, when I hear 92 94 want to be 96 mm -hmm. for our students well if I'm a student or a parent sitting thing well is the teachers hold of that same and not held to it I mean because I know things there's things happen and right. there's certain but you know are, are they at 92 and 94 you think I think they're probably very very close to 92 so that that might tell around. us but yeah. is that from because we were supposed from understand this was this program was supposed to be able to track that so that i'm going to kick it to dr Knoll. we can we can track and i've shared with the board some of our our rates but we can we can track absences by reason by school the whole the whole nine yards okay. any other questions i did have one mm -hmm. so um where you said it needed to be integrated is this something you guys have to ask them to build what you wanted to do, or is that already like a capability of the system? And that's so, it's partially integrated now. And I think, I really just think we need to configure it slightly better. And I think with our staff that we have now, we're at a much better place to do that. And it, all right, all right. Recommend that the board approve the contract with Power School for the use of Time, Clo time Clock Plus. Fiscal impact is $62,654.80. Budget source FY25. Operating budget. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Bearclaw. <laughs> Let's see. All right. I feel you. My theme. I know, right? I feel you. There we go. Good evening, President Bennett, Vice President Bent, Dr. Salins, board members, and executive team. I'm Daryl Barraclo, uh, school facility coordinator. I come before you this evening for the contract award for the replacement of the fire alarm system at Kennard Elementary School. Um, we reached out to Johnson Controls for a, uh, a it, it's a sole source uh, bid because we are using a proprietary um, fire alarm system. It is a simplex uh, control unit. Uh, what we're trying to do is um, install the same type of fire alarm throughout our schools as we move forward. Um, this is similar systems that we've done in the past few years, moving forward with the same installation. We just did Sudlersville and Church, Churchill Elementary last year. They're finishing up now. Um, so this is a Johnson Controls sole source uh, installation. Um, and in addition to that, uh, one of the other reasons why we're going with Johnson Controls is, is that it uh, maintains their uh, mobile 
app device that they use that, that our maintenance crew can use and get instant notifications on systems being down or in trouble or if a device is down or something like that. So it helps tremendously with getting folks on site to, to do the right thing when it needs to be done and, and have a little bit of uh, advanced notice of, of things versus a telephone call. So um, we're utilizing Johnson Controls. We're purchasing the materials through Johnson Controls, which in doing so, we are uh, avoiding uh, t uh, sales tax on that. Then Johnson Controls goes out and they solicit installation prices from various uh, uh, electricians to do the installation. And what you'll see is um, with this installation, they've, they've contacted four separate uh, electricians and the electricians provided the installation numbers and you'll see that uh, Lywood Electric um, out of um, Federalsburg uh, provided the lowest installation price of $107,000. So with Johnson Controls management and uh, materials cost and design, it comes to $254,000. And as a side note, this project is uh, state funded and it was state funded um, in prior years, state funded. So this is a 51-49% split between local and state. So. I have a question, is Johnson Controls, will they be overseeing the electricians or is that gonna be? Our they they will be overseeing the electricians because it's 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 almost as if a sub they are a subcontractor to Johnson Controls. So thank you. Yep. What is the um, lifespan and warranty on the system? Uh, the warranty would be a two year parts and labor uh, on the on the installation. Um, then there's manufacturers warranties on the various products, whether it's uh, heat detectors or smoke detectors, whatever the different devices would be that would come from the various manufacturers of the products. But then um, from a life uh, standpoint, we're looking at probably 20 to 25 years, um, given what we've seen out of the prior systems that we're replacing. Okay, thank you. And just about the, I, a few times, the labor, this is just labor since Johnson's, so that's a big difference in those companies and you're comfortable that Lywood will? Correct, yeah, the, the Lywood and the Battaglia and the Nickel Electric, those are just installation <laughs> prices. So Johnson Controls would then put their materials portion on top of that. So that's why you'll see that the total cost uh, that we would be awarding to Johnson Controls is $254,000. That's inclusive of Lywood Electric right. in that 254. I just mean nickel was $100,000 more, so almost double. So you're, it's just, a, and then even Battaglia is 50%. Correct. More, so, okay. Yep. All right. Any other questions? Nope. So just the board, the board approved the contract with Johnson Controls for the installation of a new fire alarm system at Kennard Elementary School. Fiscal impact, $254,000. Budget source, $142,000 from FY24 local funds, $29,000 from FY25 local funds, and $140,250 from FY24 state funds. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All right. Next up, uh, similar to the presentation that I just made on the Canard project, this is for a contract approval for the replacement of the fire alarm system at Queen Anne's County High School. Uh, similar to Canard, this is a proprietary simplex uh, fire alarm system with Johnson Controls uh, materials. Johnson Controls would be overseeing the installation. And similarly, we have uh, the same four uh, electrical contractors that were solicited, Lywood Electric, Battaglia, and Nickel. And Lywood was also low on the installation cost for this project at $450,000. The total cost of uh, purchased materials, which is Johnson Controls materials plus the installation, comes to $855,557. I just had a question about the budget source total, why it's over a million, um, million ninety. I'm not sure where those, that number's coming from if we're asking. That's the it. funds that are available. Okay. So I, what I did when, when I put the, the information together, I wanted to show that we have adequate funding. We won't be utilizing all of that. And then again, this is, since this is a state funded project, we would, we would use 51% of the total contract value 
would come from the state, and then we would utilize the make up 49% in local funds. Thank you. And so whatever was remaining in state funds would just be pushed to push to, to, to next coming years. And the funding. local funds are capital? Pardon? Local funds are capital? All capital, yes, correct. So if we save some there, then that can go not, I mean, we, ha we have a capital surplus fund somewhere, I hope. Yes, we do. Yes. Any other questions? Um, I'm just assuming the warranty lifespan is the same as the previous? E exact same thing, yes. Okay. And then just the cost is just because the school's so much bigger? Yes, okay. yes. It, we're looking at an elementary school, very simple installation, single story versus a multi-story high school, much more square feet. Thank you. Sure. Recommend that the board approve the contract with Johnson Controls for the installation of a new fire alarm system at Queen Anne's County High School. Fiscal impact $855,557. Budget source $560,995 from FY25 local funds and 529,750 from FY24 state funds. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Next up. Three dots. Yeah, the, the three dots. Right. The three dots on the top right. I got you. Oh. <laughs> IT's coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Thank you. All right. Next on the agenda that I have is the presentation of the Educational Facilities Master Plan. Um, this is for the uh, 2024 um, year which includes FY25 and beyond projects. Uh, again, my name is Daryl Barraclo, School Facility Coordinator, and moving on to the next slide. Okay, the purpose of the EFMP is to provide a written plan that provides educational goals, standards, guidelines, um, it gets into the community analysis, uh, concluding that the plan conforms to the adopted county and municipal comprehensive planning growth management strategies. Uh, what we've done is we've reached out to county planning. Uh, we've obtained um, birth records uh, from Maryland Department of Planning, uh, coordinated that with our enrollment projections, um, looked at uh, subdivision, build out, building permits that have been requested and so forth. Um, it also goes through an inventory and an evaluation of the existing school buildings. Uh, as I mentioned, enrollment data, uh, projected enrollment data, and the analysis of the future school needs, which I'll get into a little bit further detail, and various school policies relating to school capacity, student transportation, and other administrative matters. Um, as required, uh, this the Educational Facilities Master Plan is required by Comar to be uh, completed and updated and sent to the IAC annually. Uh, it is due to the IAC on July 1, so we're seeking approval here, here tonight in June so that we can meet the July 1st deadline. Um, the, uh, the EFMP uh, and the CIP actually go hand in hand with one another. It's basically a two-step process. The Educational Facilities Master Plan uh, provides long-range planning. It provides kind of the ground, uh, the groundwork for the CIP program that will be coming up to you guys very shortly in the next few months. Uh, we'll be working on the development of that after the EFMP gets approved. The EFMP components, as you can see by the, the short um, uh, list of various things that are, that are included in there, it goes over a, a large array of different, uh, different topics from uh, the goals and standards, policies, uh, enrollment capacity, facility inventory, and, and finally the facility needs. The facility needs is, in my opinion, is probably the most important part of the EFMP because it's going to be the groundwork for what our CIP is going to be for the next five years. So the annual dates, as I mentioned, we're looking for approval of the EFMP so we can meet the uh, July submission date for the state. Um, and then that will lay the groundwork for the capital improvement plan, which we will need to get into the state approval in October. 
and then we were talking about funding, which would be July funding of next year. That would be the FY26 fiscal year. So a couple of things that I, I wanted to point out that were um, uh, important items and changes and additions. Um, one of the things that, that we looked at over the year um, came from the blueprint initiatives and most importantly, the three-year-old uh, pre-kindergarten uh, requirements that are coming from the initiative. Um, in order to accommodate that at Centerville Elementary School, um, Centerville Elementary School currently is right around 100% capacity. I want to say it's right around 96 to 98% capacity. Um, with the introduction of the three-year-old pre-K at that school, it would certainly be, uh, there certainly would be crowding issues at that school. Um, and with, uh, with the pre-K program not being funded at the state level, um, building additions really aren't on the table at that school. So what we would be looking to do would be to um, move the second graders from Centerville Middle and send them to Kennard. I'm, Centerville Elementary. Elementary. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Centerville Elementary. Centerville Elementary and sending them to Kennard Elementary School. And then obviously that would create uh, crowding issues there. So what we would look to do is, is move the fifth graders from Kennard and move them to Centerville Middle School. Um, that accomplishes a couple of different things for us. Um, uh, most importantly, it does address the pre-K issues and it gets, the, gets them into uh, Centerville Elementary School. Um, the other thing that it does for us is um, Centerville Middle School has been tracking around 110 to 115 students below the current state rated capacity. Um, and with us going for design, well, we're in design funding now, so we've secured design funding, but in order for us to move and gain state approval for the construction funding of whether it's a renovation or replacement school, which is yet to be determined, that would come by the feasibility study, um, in order to really help secure the, the state's approval of that, we've got to show that we're going to be at very close to the state rated capacity. So if we weren't looking to do this, the state would really shy away from fund, well, number one, they wouldn't fund it at the full square footage that, that a renovation would take place. So that would really be uh, be, a, be an issue for, for the renovation or the replacement of, of Centerville Middle. So that that's one of the uh, most important uh, changes or additions that you'll see in the EFMP. The other thing that um, that you you may uh, or may not have picked up is um, in fiscal year, I believe it was 28, we had feasibility studies for additions to the two high schools. We've taken them out of the um, out of the the projected uh, scope of projects. And what we're looking at is a uh, CTE facility, um, which would again accomplish some of uh, the the overcrowding at Queen Anne's County High School. Um, we would be able, you know, if, if we had a dedicated CTE facility that could handle the automotive and some of the building uh, building science programs, it would free up a lot of square footage at Queen Anne's County High School. We could renovate that back section of the building make it into classroom spaces, make it functional, get rid of the portables that are alongside of the school. Um, it, it would accomplish a lot of things. And what we're looking at um, with the middle school feasibility study is, is we're tasking the architect to look at kind of a uh, more or less of like a master <laughs> plan for what happens with this building, what happens with uh, the existing middle school, and what happens with the grounds next to the middle school because obviously if we do a replacement school and it is on site at the middle school site it's obviously going to need to be not on top of the existing footprint so we're looking at uh it, it's it's really kind of a, a big mix of, of different things so the op the the possibilities exist to where what may weigh out in the feasibility plan is, is does it make more sense for the middle school to be here on site uh, on this location? We would have to look at the dynamics of the site 
look at the dynamics of the buildings, what, what needs to be taken down. Obviously, the, the historical portions of the two sections up front would be the sections we'd look to keep, take down the sections in the back and, and build them out accordingly. Or does it make more sense for this to be the CTE location and, or, or vice versa between the CTE location at the middle school site and, and vice versa? So those are really the two biggest things that you'll see in this year's EFMP. So I do have a question. Um, I'm interested to know if you got any projected numbers. And the only reason why I ask is because as a representative of North County, we have a lot of building going on. Um, we have new, we have one existing development where a builder is in and they promised to have 40 to 45 new homes built by the December of 25. That will bring some families and students. And then we have three other developments in that area that are picking up. We so. we've been in discussion with with planning and zoning, and and we're we are tracking those developments. They they've received planning approval, but have they moved forward from the planning stages yet? And that's kind of where we're we're. It's kind of very difficult to gauge whether or not that's going to move as quickly as as projected. There's a lot of things that are in play with right. like interest rates and product material costs and all those different things so in one neighborhood we are nine houses in the middle of either there's a hole or there's a house they got 19 sold and they're working on it but they're trying to get to those 40 to 45 by the end of december i'm just thinking about churchill elementary sullivanville middle queen Anne's county because that's where those feet into and we, and we have weighed some of that in, into the okay. projections yes because when you look to bounce off shannon's question um where she brings up the developments, what I had written down was if you look at the numbers for like Sutherville Middle School, it's projecting a lower population at the school in 2033 than we have now. And, you know, with all the building and survey and everything that's going down, I was, you know, when you talked about the state rated, the capacities, what happens if we do get an influx and those numbers are way higher? How does that affect? Well, at, at the middle school, we have an abundance of capacity there so uh, from a from an impact standpoint the numbers would go up it really would not impact the school because if, I, I believe I don't have the number directly in front of me I but think I'll, it said now we're at 71 percent with the 400 and whatever and I, and I think that school has about a 700 seat yeah. capacity so we've got plenty of room to grow if if the numbers didn't weigh out in the in the enrollment projections um, you know we prior years projections um, counted on a lot of growth, um, but that growth came, and that growth came in the tune of 55 plus communities. So that really doesn't bear out seats in in the school. So that's 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 why we had to kind of scale some of the growth numbers back. So um, you know we'll keep a we'll keep an eye on it, and it's it's always a. It, their, their projections. I mean, that's we, we do the do, best that we can. I think what's really important to understand is that this is an annual report. Mm -hmm. So every year we review it. And Correct. if we need to make changes at that point is when we make changes. So, Correct. you know, exactly what we're saying right now may not come true that we may get start to see numbers grow and we may have to shift, you know, our, our mindset of where, what we're thinking. So I did want to just say this isn't like a five year, you know, right. we don't these, revisit these it every year we revisit this. And so we look at those projections really closely. Yeah, we'll um, get we'll get projections. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we'll get we'll get new enrollment numbers yeah. in probably four months reality wise because it's the end of September. So we'll have new numbers to show where we where we're kind of playing out. Just it's kind of nice how that and question though, I'm sorry real quick that just one thing about the 55 plus community so I know that with four seasons on the island 80 percent of the people who bought homes there they said were already living in Queen Anne's County which means they left their homes to move into the retirement community which meant that left all their homes open oh. for children um, so that's I sometimes I don't know if we consider all of that but then the question is where does the state at what percentage are we able to ask them to help support either renovating or or supporting a new building there's really not a fixed percentage on where we need to, to, to weigh out whether you know some people have said if you're within 90 percent of your state rated capacity but there's really nothing fixed hard written in black and white that says what that percentage is um, I, I, I can say that the state has gotten 
um, very stingy with their funding this past year. Um, I've, I've been on telephone calls mm -hmm. with other county, LA, other LEAs, and the state has actually um, not funded the second year of a few projects that they guaranteed multi-year funding on and left counties kind of in a lurch. And now the counties are scrambling to see local being money to position. make that. Well, remember up. January. They're in session January. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right now. Yeah. yeah. Two things. Yeah, Speaking of up, up North mm -hmm. County, you talked about talk to Queenians planning and zoning. One of the big elephants is Southernsville. They mm. have they have a lot of capacity in their water and sewer system. Yep. And they're looking for development. Mm. Yep. And if, if something happens up there with multifamily or something, that to me would be a lot more than single family homes. I mean, mm -hmm. so do we, I mean, I know the county has some, mm -hmm. but they've annexed some large properties into Southernsville and they have an issue with their source. They, 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 they need people. Yeah. And that's a concern of mine. The other thing, Central Middle School, moving fifth grade there, will everybody be inside? Yes. Yes. So we're because not looking. We're not looking at any portables. No, there oh, no, no, would no, not no, be no, any no, portables no, no. there. Okay. No, because we we what we're looking to do is is um, we would plan for the fifth grade to move. We would look at the the, the enrollment from fifth grade to eighth grade, and we would build a school to accommodate that enrollment. I mean, because that's some of the stuff that comes up, and parents mm -hmm. start getting you know questions like that. And I yes, just and, make and sure we're not. The, the one thing that the state won't do is the state won't allow. The, well, the state won't fund. Over, over what the enrollments are, are 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 at that current year. So, regardless of what projections are showing, they won't fund beyond what the enrollments right. are. Well, that's what we had with so. Canal High School. We they would only fund it. I think it. Uh, right. You went in extra. You know, thousand nine hundred, and we went up. The county had to four fund twelve hundred kids. Right. Yeah. So one thing I will say about that, though, <clears throat> as being a parent on the other side, that had a fifth grader that ended up in a middle school when we weren't notified we need to make sure that if that's uh. where we're going we are very um, transparent and we talk to our parents mm -hmm. and they understand what the impacts are because having been a parent who was told in a very short period of time that my fifth grader is going to be in a middle school that wasn't cool that wasn't cool and we weren't happy about it and well, I and, want and, us to and, do a better job than was done previously, and that's and, and that's why we're that's why I'm kind of bringing it up tonight. Um, this is not something that's planned for 25, 26, or anything like that. This is something that we would implement after the renovation or the replacement school was built at at Centerville Middle. So there there's a few years in here, uh, un, unless of course the three year old program forces our hand. So that that's the other. I mean, there's there's a we have to look at both ends of this. And I, Dr. Kibler was, was involved in a lot of this as well, so. I, I would just say this is part of the blueprint implementation where we're rolling out our pre-K expansion in the district. And we had to talk about how we're addressing four-year-old program and three-year-old program. It's taken us three years, next year being the third, where we'll just have the full day four-year-old program available at every school and that's not even universal yet so bringing Centerville Elementary School online next year and having hopefully four classes there mm -hmm. so we'll the next step as we get through this is starting to talk about how we're going to address the three-year-old um, pre-k classes throughout the district and we will take a slow and steady approach to that just like we did with four-year-olds and look where we have the capacity first um, the, the implementation of the pre-k it goes over that 10 or 12 year program into 2030s. So we have time and I think that bringing it up now and, and we're, we're doing, you know, what you asked Ms. Bent, where we're letting the community know some of the potential plans and, and, and I think it's good. I think we've had a positive response with our four year old rollout and hopefully this is setting the stage for. And, and likely we have to look at Ken Island Elementary School, Bayside Elementary School and looking at going over to Mattapique Middle School. We may see the same thing there where we would have to relocate second graders over to Bayside and therefore fifth graders over. Mm -hmm. So it's a conversation we're starting now. Doesn't mean that it's absolutely gonna happen, but it's something that is on the table of an option that we need to take in order to meet blueprint for three-year-old implementation of pre-K. And then how much money was from the state for this pre-K? Zero, right? Well, there's very little. So it's, of yeah, I, I wanted to, the one thing when, when, when we talked yes. about 
not funding pre-K. It was not funding the building expansion right, right. for that, pre-K. We are getting pre-K expansion to help set up our classrooms and then the student enrollment to support uh, the students there. It's not. It's just not the buildings. So this that is one area of the blueprint where I feel like the the state money is is there. We're seeing that. They give us a start up for capital. No. No. Correct. And right, and once we my, set my up. mistake, but that yeah, when I meant funded it was strictly mm -hmm. not not funded from a capital standpoint and, and the pre-k expansion expansion is just that it's to expand the program so they provide you with everything you need to start up meaning furniture and even teacher salary the first year but please understand after that first year those yeah. teachers have to be brought right. into the district right so that also impacts yeah. our staffing yeah very similar to the esser grants i mean correct paid for, for yeah. a couple yes yeah and, and then, then, then the money goes mm -hmm. away all right any other questions that was a long discussion I uh, suggest the Board of Ed approve the 24, 2024 Educational Facilities Master Plan. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hickey. She was not able oh. to be here this evening. Okay. Um, Tom. So, yes, yeah, Dr. Dr. Kibler, Kibler is going to. Yes. And if the board has additional questions, we can always, you know, address it. Sure. Yeah. So, good evening, uh, Dr. Kibler, Assistant Superintendent. Good evening, Ms. Bennett, the President, and uh, Superintendent Dr. Salen, board members, and executive team. Uh, so, last month you all approved. Um, you know, as we transition to the in-house food service management. So last month you all approved um, the Cisco contract as well as the milk contract, piggybacking off of Comico, I believe. Uh, this month we bring two additional that kind of bring us to the end of these initial contracts, I, I believe. So piggybacking off of Cecil County, um, the food related cafeteria products, so kind of your paper products, plates, uh, utensils, things of that nature. Um, so that's the first one up here. I just have a question just about the two together just real quick is why are we not um, getting these two items from Cisco? I know they provide, they have bread products and they have paper products. Um, it seems as if we bought more from Cisco, maybe it would be a deal. So I don't know why we're not, why are we not using Cisco? I think uh, it's because she didn't get as good of a deal and that's why okay. she's piggybacking off of this one, okay. which has gone out, put bits out and found that, that the, this product or this company actually was a better than, than the Cisco. Correct. I, I think that's what that's what the whole purpose of going out and looking or piggybacking off of somebody is, that you put it all out there and who is your best man standing at the end of the day. Um, I don't know if Sid would like to weigh in. What was the question? I said, well, I was wondering why we weren't using Cisco for these two contracts when they do have, uh, they provide bread and they provide paper products. Um, so it seemed like maybe Cisco would give us an even better break if we're buying more from them. So I didn't know why we're doing a different vendor for these two contracts. Well, this was a bid that's already been put out that was the lowest bid that they could locate for it. Um, and then I thought the question was, why was it bread? Why was it, I'm having a hard time hearing with this, but uh, yeah, sorry. It, yes. it was, this was already pre-bid out for that. Do, do we, are, mm -hmm. there's no, uh, they're not listed on the yellow sheet, right? No, they're not. The other bids? N no, because it's Cecil County's contract. So it's, right. it's, not it's based off of theirs. Their proposed. They, they're the ones who kind of did the heavy lift, they're for lack of better words. Bid. They went out, took it so out. So we don't, bid. so we don't know, like, do we know what it would have been through Cisco? Is that what you're saying that? I, I can see if we can get even more of their documentation. I know this was just part of it, okay. but, but I can see to get that to, to you all I, for sure. So the bidding was done through Cecil County yeah. on their end, but on Facts. our end, we didn't see the difference between if we went with Cisco for this stuff, like what, how much more would that cost us with the contract we already approved for them? We, that would. So I'm, I'm sure we could, I'm sure we could see that. I, I didn't directly see that that would have been uh, what Ms. Hickey took care of and presented just the bit, the contract document showing that we can piggyback off of it and assuming that they picked the best price. I mean, the piggybacking option, it, it gives you a better deal because it basically is more buying power 
So we're in Queen Anne's County, we're very, very small. But when you put Cecil County, who's twice the size of us, together with other counties that have piggybacked, then you get this buying powder, power that's larger than if we just go to an individual and say we would like to have a contract with you. That, that's the concept of piggybacking. But we already so have a, a buy, contract with Cisco, so. But not for this product. Right, but how much would it cost us? Could we see, I mean, you know, echoing off of Dick's being fiscally responsible and we're in a crisis here, I, I, like, hmm. what is the difference? So we would have to put it out to bid. Yes, yes. Well, I'm just, what I'm saying is we just don't we don't know, correct? We're just piggybacking off of Cecil counties. You're piggybacking off of Cecil counties, but I would I would venture to say there are quite a few school systems in the state of Maryland that are using this contract. Um, usually when that happens, a lot of the larger counties have already did the research on that and the footwork. We're just a smaller county that you know, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to do that. But I would venture to say if you looked at a lot of these that it's pretty much a large portion of the state that is using it. I believe we were the eighth person on the Cisco contract, or eighth district. Eighth county. Eighth, person, eighth, yeah. eighth district on the shore specifically that piggybacked off of that mm -hmm. Cisco contract. I, I am, I'm, and I'm sure that they, that it's right, it's nice that they did the heavy lifting, but I'm looking at their first sheet where it says we agree to renew the contract pending a price review. And so I guess I'm thinking if, if since they already did all that, maybe yes. we could just We can certainly show, go back and get it, sure. Yeah. So that we can see that, oh, wow, this is a- Sure. Right, this comparison, they did a good job and we don't, and we didn't have to do it again, but there's no numbers. Yeah, I'm happy to go back and get, and see if, what other documentation we can get to add. Is that what you were- Yeah, that's fine, yeah. that's why- it... Yeah, sure, we can get that. Um, and then I would say this is, we do need to, to, to move on this for our summer programming that, that starts in July too. So, um, and the, the amounts that are listed here are based on what our numbers have been, um, our usage has been um, under our current, looking at um, what Sodexo has been using in the district. Okay. Any other questions? I guess it says budget source, food service fund balance. Are we using money that we've got from this year to fund this, or is this all going to be next? Um, this is so our, our food service is a separate fund because it's we it's our technically it's our fund five, mm -hmm. right? It's our fund five. Um, so that has its own separate food balance account. So going forward, this will be in the food service operating budget, but our startup cost we have to use like the savings, the fund balance from food service, because, and it's know, separate from our operating fund balance. Oh, I know it's separate from operating, but yeah. I mean, we're doing this and we all agree to it. So I'm also, it, I got one little bird that concerns me, but <laughs> is Cisco guaranteed we wouldn't lose money? It, I mean, pretty much they'd run it at a certain figure. No. We have, they didn't guarantee we'd lose money? You said Cisco. I, I'm not Cisco. Cisco, uh, Cisco, 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 whatever. I'm sorry. Cisco. Sorry about that. Cisco. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we Cisco. used to, did we have some kind of fund balance where they paid for some of our equipment and stuff when we, over the years? Many, many, many years ago. That hadn't happened recently. But it's going to be a separate balance, so we'll make sure we don't lose money. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> I hopefully. Gotcha. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. yes. What was the last <laughs> <budget>? <laughs> So we're, uh, we're also like, we're, we're, Thinking about making a separate budget just for food service too, so we can track I think it that better. Yeah. Right, so we can track Absolutely. that better as well. Be so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, it's 100% a separate fund, so we can give you reports that are completely separate as well. So both look into formally documenting it better as well. Any other questions about that? Do you want to go ahead and do the second one and we can, do you mind then, Shannon, we can just do both of them? Since sure, it's, this, it's the same same idea, Cecil okay. County. So the la last month, the two contracts uh, were comic I put forward. These are the Cecil County ones. So this is for the bread, bread and rolls. Any other questions? And again, the amount, the amount here is based on what we needed, the amount of uh, bread products we needed to buy for this year, uh, projecting for next year. <coughs> and it includes summer. Correct. Yes, but that's right. The pressing now, right? Right. Yes. Soon. All right. So I uh, recommend that we approve the budget related to the cafeteria products con contract with FPC distribution to piggyback off of Cecil County Public Schools. Fiscal impact 140, 142000 for um, uh, the cafeteria products contract and 140,000 for bread and rolls budget source the food service fund balance 
Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. We'll get Julie to get you all some additional information. Right. I'm going to, yeah, yeah, get that. Mr. Pinder. Good evening, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team. For the record, my name is Sid Pinder, Chief Operating Officer. Um, I'm here before you tonight to seek approval for Mr. Ezekiel Whitlock of the Northern County Exchange LLC to purchase a new bus, new or used bus, for the 24-25 school year to replace bus 2510. Um, bus 2510 has met its life cycle of 15 years to Comar. Um, so we are seeking tonight for approval for um, Mr. Whitlock to go forward with purchasing a new or used bus. The cost associated with that is it would be the PVA, which is in our operating budget that we look at each year. There are no questions. Can I get a motion? Motion to approve. Mr. Ezekiel Whitlock to purchase a new or used bus for the 24-25 school year to replace bus 2510 fiscal impact PVA budget source 25 operating budget. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I just like it to reflect that the agenda item needs to have an addition to it that says or used. So um, thank you. If we just make sure that I've repeated what he said. Exactly. And I thank you for doing that. <laughs> it wasn't accurately reflected on the yellow sheet. So the yellow sheet needs to be modified to say or used. Oh. Putting every glasses on. On the front. <laughs> we're good. You said it right. It just yes. wasn't reflected correctly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kibler, policy from charter schools. Sure. So I bring to you tonight after uh, two reads of the charter school policy updates of which we received no comments. So just seeking approval um, of that. There's no questions. Can we get a motion? Motion to approve policy 102 subject to the final edits for format and style. Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Groh. <laughs> Gently waiting back there. <laughs> I have to make Again. you sit closer. So you have yeah. to walk so far. <laughs> All right. Uh, again, John Grove, Supervisor of Accountability. Uh, I bring to you uh, uh, seeking approval. This is our third time uh, coming back for uh, policy number 642, test administration and dissemination of test data. Um, to my knowledge, we have not had any more comments, um, so we're seeking approval um, for this policy. There's no questions. Can I get a motion? A board should approve policy 642 subject to final ed edits for format and style second all those in favor aye. aye thank you thank you and last but not least mr evans good evening president bennett dr salins members of the board executive committee for the record my name is matt evans supervisor of student services before you tonight are three policies for approval um, first is number 508 behavior threat assessment there was a revision after um, the second read under purpose where it now reads serious threats of violence stated against any persons in Queen Anne's County Public Schools community will not be tolerated and will be handled through disciplinary action. All right. And that was based on our last yeah, our conversation mm -hmm. last time. Anyone have any other questions? Can I get nope. a motion? All right. Motion to approve policy 508 subject to final edits for format and style. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next is policy, is the uh, policy 511 student discipline, the revision from the second read were Mr. Schifanelli's uh, proposals that are before you now. If there's any, if there's no questions, can I get a motion? Motion to approve policy 511, subject to final edits for format and style. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. And the last policy is number 517, illness at school. No, no revision since the first read. No questions. Can I get a motion? A motion to approve policy 517, subject to final edits for format and staff. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're scheduled for a break. Do we want to push through? Keep going. All right.
Informational items, Ms. Passon. I am back again. Again, good evening, uh, President Bennett, members of the board, Dr. Salins, and members of the executive team. My name is Bridget Passon. I'm the English language arts supervisor for grades three through 12. Um, I am here with an informational item to request secondary novels recommended by materials of instruction committee members for inclusion in ELA and English curricula be made available for a 30-day public review in accordance with the materials of instruction regulation section D. Novels will be available in the front office of the Board of Education. Additionally, there are links to reviews of each novel on the materials of instruction evaluation forms. Anyone have any questions or comments? And there's no action. Nope, there's no yeah. action. All right. When you, All right. When you yeah, have the committee we'll put together, I see you have one parent. Do we get, his, I mean, more than one parent can be on that committee if they wanted to be? Yes. And then a couple we people. had two um, our interpreters are parents and some okay. of them served as a second parent so okay. um, in a couple instances we had more than one parent which we were thrilled i mean it's good because you know we hear this and, the, and then nobody wants to get involved they better look at it up front no we were sure to get them thank you all right be back in july thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you all right dr guido Good evening, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, members of the board and the executive team. For the record, my name is Dr. Darren Guido, supervisor of instruction in the areas of social studies, world languages, service learning, multilingual learners, including Title III, Part C, and the Migrant Education Program, which is Title I, Part C, uh, for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Tonight, I'm bringing before you information about the open public review of English 3D. It's an English language development curriculum resource for our six middle and high school ELD classrooms. English 3D is a resource that is a part of the HMH family of curricula that is currently used in our classrooms, including interreading in grades K to five and collections in grades six through eight, as well as the intervention program Read 180. Like Read 180, English 3D is in HMH's intervention category and focuses on building on our multilingual learners existing linguistic strengths to accelerate their English proficiency. English 3D is the only ELD program that earned the WIDA Prime 2020 Seal of Alignment, similar to Ed Reports, which is used to show curriculum alignment to ELA, math, and science standards. The WIDA Prime 2020 Seal indicates that WIDA-trained reviewers believe the publisher has provided sufficient evidence to a degree of alignment between a given set of instructional materials and the Prime rubric. This is important as it shows that English 3D materials are aligned to the WIDA ELD standards. Those are the same standards on which our students are assessed on the annual WIDA Access for ELS assessment. Each of our middle school and high school multilingual teachers received a preview copy of course B and C, and we have those available for the public to review as well. And they also had access to the two volumes of language launch resources, which are online. Language launch one meets the needs of our newcomer students Generally, those are students who are performing at the lowest level of English proficiency, and volume two is that next level up. Courses B and C are middle school and high school aligned, uh, and they are designed for students in the performance level three, four, and five range. Com encompasses all four of the language domains that our students are assessed on. I'm going to be, or we will be requesting a five-year subscription for both online access and print resources, and this will help our uh, multilingual learners uh, continue to grow in their English language proficiency. I have a question just about the 118,000 for the yes. six. So this five-year purchase, is that 118,000 per year or that's for the five years? And it's even it's the for five years. And it's, it's a it's lump. Including the consumables each year? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Online access, the print materials, and then there are five years of consumables that will be sent to us and we're paying for all that up front. So that would be the only money we're paying for five years. What have we been using now for our multilingual? Nothing. That's a, yeah, that's a great question. Great question. And really. it depends on the teacher and yep. the day and the year and what they can get their hands on. Yes, exactly. We have not had anything formal right. um, in, in the way. And, and the, our population continues to grow. So our need it gets yes. greater and greater every day. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, through the strategic plan, we ended up adding five additional mm -hmm. EL teachers. 
um, we probably could add five more and still could easily. wouldn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it, it's definitely a, a need that has been neglected and these will be through grant funds. So yes. this is not part of the right. operational uh, budget. This, I just yeah. was and, and actually the previous one was also through grant funds and not through operational. The lead, it, it's really exciting that we could use leads while we have it to get something last for five bit. years that we don't know. So, so what Ms. Passon brought is really going to help specifically with the gender gap issue. I, I think that kind of glossed over that part yeah. with the male protagonists that I know that was important to the board. And then this need for the, for the curriculum and to be able to do that through the grant and relieve our operating budget for, for years is huge. Thank you. Is there any other questions or comments? Thank you for your Thank time. Thanks Thank for you. waiting. Sure. Ms. Gast. Hello again. President Bennett, Vice President Bennett, um, Dr. Shailing, Dr. Kibler, members of the board, the executive team. I'm Whitney Gast, uh, the CFO for Queens County Public Schools. I bring to you tonight um, for information just the draft budget book. Again, this was presented to you informally at the last meeting. Um, this is this does not include the additional funding that the commissioners have promised. We are waiting for their formal budget on June 11th. And then after we have that, we will present to you our final budget with the additional funding. Well, thank you for the answering the questions. Oh, you're welcome. Yep. I was going to say and, some by some oh, board members. Um, anyone else have any questions? No. Uh -uh. I did so, have about, mm -hmm. go ahead. No. Okay. No, no go ahead. Well, it was actually, um, more around the budget, um, I was wondering, Dr. Salens, because I know this has been an issue that has been repeated over and over again with, you know, mismanaging of the budget and saying the money, is, where is it gone? Um, if they could explain a little bit about the COVID monies drying up and the grant, some of the sure. positions, you know, that were funded by grants that they're gone. Absolutely. So. Yeah, so we actually received um, three ESSER grants. Um, each one of those grants were designated to do different things. Um, one was specifically designated to reduce the gap that students had. One was for supplies um, and PPE, everything, PPE, yeah. PPE yeah. and all the new words that we, we learned through COVID. Um, and those funds are at a cliff right now. So um, we did have some positions that were in ESSER funds. Matter of fact, um, initially our five EL teachers were in there and then we were pulling them over into our operating budget over the course of several years. Um, we had to float nurses in our ESSER funds. Um, subs. Permanent subs. Permanent subs yes. were. We had 16 permanent subs in our in, in those funds, and those funds have dried up, so those positions have been eliminated. We also had leads money, which had several positions in it. Um, and again, that leads money, we're at the very last tail end of the leads money. We have less than $250,000 um, out of almost $7 million that we have spent. Um, we've done great things with that. It's coming down to the wire, and we're just trying to do those amendments so that we can squeeze out the last little bit of that money and, and make sure we do good things for kids. Um, but that cliff was real, and it hit us mm. hard, and we, we knew it was coming. It was hard to, to brace for it. It was hard, you know, especially in combination with, um, you know, the blueprint mandates, which were significantly underfunded and uh, continue to be underfunded. So our hope is that we will see um, increases in our state monies next year in order to help us so like we don't go back to what mr smith mm -hmm. was saying where we're in the same exact position as we were this year so four basically four major grants there is a couple others that we got in in there but four major grants that brought us millions and millions of dollars thank you thank you um, I, I just want to say that this budget book, just for everyone, does not include the $1.2 million of additional right. funding that she the commissioners have publicly said. But I want to make sure that's very, very clear out there. Um, so when the budget comes back to the board on the 26th of June, it will have the additional $1.2 million because the, the, we will have had the official approval of the commissioners on June 11th with their budget. So And that could be sent us least a week in advance so we can look at it yes that will go to, that will be to the board by the 20th yes, the close of business the on the 20th yeah. and we, we have, have a meeting on, on the 26th so that will be posted for the board on the 20th which is a Thursday yes yes sir. anything else we can Maybe move on to, to expense status re status yeah. report. I'm gonna say yep and then next up um, it, so I didn't feel what <laughs> say. Yeah. Yeah. sure next up we're just on um, the monthly expenditure status reports and open to questions or concerns about we're tracking well, what we've predicted I did about month. the supplies and material the 210 percent 
um, in the, I'm sorry. Supplies and material under category 11, maintenance of plant um, that were over 200%. Did, did just, are these those uh, unexpected, like with the boiler or? Fuel probably. Pardon? I was gonna say it that includes fuel, fuel and the cost of that has been growing. Yeah, but I didn't, yeah, I guess. Is that what it is? It well, just, we, we, we knew we were gonna be over because we haven't put any money in that line item for, um, that's that's why we're trying to kind of write the ship it. in that category right okay. now. Um, so we, we knew we had been trending under budget there um, okay. yeah. significantly actually, okay. since it hasn't been right. um, increased in 12 years, I believe was the 12 years. <laughs> right. yeah. okay. And that specific yeah. line includes like repairs to buildings and yeah. equipment. And, and I will say that, um, that Ms. Gass will be bringing forth to the board a series of amendments. We're very late in the school year, um, and and instead of kind of putting some here and then putting another's this way, we decided we thought it was best to bring all the amendments at the same the time, budget, um, budget amendments, so that when you see monies where you shift from one category, where you're over one category, under in another, she will present to you and say, we'd like to move this money from here to here so that we can balance that. We do that every year, but sometimes we do it a little earlier and um, so you'll be seeing budget amendments coming to you soon. Definitely on um, the July, and the July meeting will have budget amendments for you. Yeah, and so that, that'll help us to get down to our bottom line. Um, and it'll also include um, the um, fund balance. approval of the fund balance transfer from fund balance into operating budget. So you'll see all those amendments coming up. Okay. So be, be prepared, Thank you know, be all expecting right. them. Yeah. All right. And, we, and we've gone over this many a time with this budget but a lot of times the public doesn't see everything. Category number 12. Mm -hmm. Yes, those are our fixed charges. So that's huh? where, those are, category 12 are our fixed charges. So it's, that's it's just for the public, can you just name a couple of them because that's sure. a pretty big number. Um, that is where our, one of the huge ones is that is our health insurance, which we under, under budgeted estimated. by and, yep. millions last year. So yes. we are working that we have I mean I mean you know when we talk about it I mean, that, that's a benefit that you know we you know, it's, it's gone employees. up a lot yep. more than significantly you know, we under than. underestimated it so we were started out the year in the hole and then our Didn't costs increased yeah. um so where were we saying increased. right I was gonna say we estimated for 24 the estimate was 11.7 million dollars and right now we have already spent we're spending close to we are at 15 million, no. That's like $4 million. million. Yeah, 14 mm -hmm. point something. And for every, yeah. what was it, about 6% increase in health insurance, which we know does as about a we're, million dollars? Next year, we're using a 7% estimate. Which yeah. is going to so, be over a million. Over a million yeah. dollars. But I mean, you know, that's what, I mean. That's what, that's the employer cost of the health insurance. And for the public to understand. Right, yes, and we're paying the majority pay. of it. Yes, yes we so, are. For and, many of our employees, we pay 100% of the employer yeah, and cost. And when you, you know, when we get back to, you know, inflation of three or 4%, and all this is going up like this. And this is going up 7%, not 3 or 4%. Uh, and and so. our contracts and some other contracts were signed. And I could be wrong, but I think there's a cliff coming. Not a cliff. It's, it's really, a cliff. it yeah. has been going up at the rate between 5 and 8% for yeah. 10 years. Um, and, yep. and we are getting to a part where we just, yeah. And that's, that's why we did Everside Health Center, which we were the first ones in the state of Maryland. They are currently in the process of upwriting four. Mm -hmm. I think they got approval for an additional four more through the state of Maryland okay. um, because of the huge impacts that they eventually will have. It's gonna take a few years to get there, but I, I think that you know we are moving in the right direction as it relates to how do we kind of cap our insurance costs. I, I, um, I think we are, but you know, it gets back it just to like, takes 10, it's, it's, it's like when we talk about green schools and all this yeah. stuff. Right. You're never going to save money because it all you're doing is reducing how much money it's going up, and, and that's and, exactly right. If you can it, cap it, and, that's and, the, and, yeah. you know, so it just it's just something that it, I, it's glad it's not our personal budget. Right. right. <laughs> I was say other items in here include um, the employer cost of our retirement for our employees that we pay, um, workman's compensation as an example in here. Um, another one is our retiree insurance. So there are additional fees that we will always be paying and that's why they are. You know, you know I, I agree with Helen, I look at the percentages they go up, but a high percentage on, you know, $500,000 mm -hmm. doesn't it's bother right. as much as a, as, as like a, as a one, high percentage yeah. on a high number. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. the compounding factor of yeah. that. Yeah. Yes, yep. indeed. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, public comment. Is there anyone signed up for the second public comment? anybody else? Or? Not at this time. All right, thank you. Then um, if I have this right, the future meetings, we have a June 26th work session at 5 p.m. And then we will have a July 17 
a meeting at 6 p.m. Correct. We might have, we might have a closed session prior to that. We don't yes. know. Okay. Okay. That, that's our regular meeting. Yes. It's, Correct. it's the 17th. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, our regular meeting, we will, we always have a close. So the July 17th, we should anticipate having yeah. a closed session prior to. Okay, is everybody all right with that? Anything else? Can I get a motion to adjourn? Well, no, I want to stay. To <laughs> so moved. Thank you. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.